All right, fantastic. I'm coming to you from the bunker of the basement of the Lindstrom household. We're having uh, some work done on our first floor and it is very loud up there. So I apologize if I don't uh, hear everything right away, but we can get things started. And um, so first item on our agenda is indeed the call to order. So let's, uh, let's do a roll call. Thank you. Fredson. Councilmember Fredson, are you still with us? There yeah, is. I don't know what's going on with my audio here, but I am here and I can hear everyone well and I'm trying to resolve some internet issues. Fantastic. So, thanks. We got gotcha. you. Sterner? Here. Thank you. Vento? Here. Wolf? Here. Zarin? Present. And Lindstrom? Here. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is the reading of the chair's statement which is the Met Council Chair has determined it is not practical or prudent to conduct in-person meetings in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Accordingly, committee members will participate in this meeting via telephone or, or other electronic means, and the meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021 at the date and time of the, uh, of the time Stated, we encourage everyone to monitor the meeting remotely. And if you have any comments, then we encourage members of the public to email us at public.info at metc.state.mn.us. And with that, that takes us to the approval of the ag agenda. So without objection, the agenda is approved. And that takes us to our fourth item, the approval of the minutes from August 24th, 2021. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? This is Sterner. I'd make a motion to approve those minutes. Thank you. And is there a second? Until seconds. Great. Roll call, please. Hudson? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zarin? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, nothing on our consent agenda this afternoon, and two items on our non consent business agenda. First one up is 2021 242 Industrial Control System Post Server Hardware. Sarah or Lon? Yep, I'll be presenting that today. Welcome. Thank you. Give me one second here. Okay, so first of all, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members. I just want to thank you guys for allowing me to introduce the business item 2021-242. Uh, it's regarding the industrial control system host server hardware. Uh, my name is Long Coffee. I work for the Process Computer Group um, in the Environmental Services Division, and I am responsible for the industrial control system for the nine wastewater treatment plants. Next slide. So a little background. Uh, 2012, Department of Homeland Security uh, did an evaluation, and it was recommended that all system hardware and software needs to be maintained and updated as required per the NIST 882 Revision 2 Cybersecurity Guidance. Um, so with that, so in 2016, we installed uh, the current host hardware uh, that was purchased and installed at the treatment plants. That was the four biggest plants, Metro, Blue Lake, Seneca, Empire, <clears throat> and then also at the regional maintenance facility. So currently this equipment is end of life and end of manufacturer support in 2021. So knowing that in 2019, we started planning, um, budgeting for this, and then with that basically put together um, what, what we're presenting today. Uh, next slide. 
So just a little bit, what is a host server? Um, host server hardware is a platform used to implement many virtual servers. So the virtual servers are configured by software to share the required resources available on the host server. So virtual servers allow for much faster deployment, more flexible system management, resilience, and reliability. So this method of implementing virtual servers instead of individual hardware reduces, reduces our overall carbon footprint um, in the system. And then that picture there is actually just a picture of one of the servers that is uh, scheduled to be replaced. Um, so basically we're, we're planning on re replacing these systems with, with like systems. So there'll be virtual platforms at the four biggest plants and regional maintenance. So that's Metro, Blue Lake, Empire, and Seneca and regional maintenance. Um, <clears throat> and then basically, you know, replacement of this harbor will ensure that we have reliable operation of the wastewater treatment plants and also um, ensure that we uh, meet compliance with all the required permits. Uh, next slide. So our procurement method, July, uh, July 8th, 2021, the requests for quotes uh, were sent out under the state contract to all the contract holders. Uh, July 21st, 2021, we received seven, uh, quotes from seven vendors. Um, and then July 26th, quotes were verified for the accuracy that we, we expected. And then it was determined that Paragon Development System and Marco were the two low responsive bidders. Um, with this, with these orders, we're basically we'll be receiving them in two orders. Uh, the first one is slated to come in at the end of the month, or excuse me, end of the year. Uh, that will be for the metro plant, um, the largest plant. And then uh, quarter one of 2022, so early next year, we're hoping to get the remaining hardware for Blue Lake, Seneca, Empire, and Regional Maintenance Facility. Next slide. So our proposed action uh, that the Met Council authorize the regional administrator to award and execute contract 21P107 with Paragon Development Systems and Marco to provide the council with the equipment from Cisco and Hewlett Packard uh, for the industrial control systems uh, in the amount not to exceed a total of 523,092. So again, that current hardware uh, that was installed in 2016 is is sitting at an end of life and in man, end of manufacturer support in 2021, uh, and it must be replaced to maintain the uh, required industrial control system security and compliance. And next slide. So that's the end of my presentation here. Um, does the uh, committee chair and committee members have any questions? Any questions for Mr. Coffey? Council Member Zirin moves the staff recommendation. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second, second. by Sturger. All right, thank you. Roll call, please. So just to clarify, I heard a couple of people seconding. Should we do Wolf or Sterner? Give it to Wolf. <laughs> Throw wolf a bone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Fredson. Hi. Sterner. Councilmember Sterner. Hi. Thank you. Vento. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yep. Vento. Hi. Wolf. Hi. Zarin. Hi. Lindstrom. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And that takes us to our second non-consent agenda item, PFAS, Legal Services Contract. Mr. Abelson or Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair and committee members. I'm Dan Abelson. I'm an attorney in the Office of General Counsel, and I'll be presenting this business item 2021-243JT PFAS legal services contract. This item will also be going to management committee next week. Uh, next slide, please. So a little background on the project. Um, there's numerous ongoing efforts in Minnesota to address per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, also called PFAS. And I think you actually may be hearing a little bit about uh, some of this in one of our later business or later 
information items today. These efforts have the potential to impact multiple aspects of the council's wastewater operations. The council determined that it needed special counsel with PFAS knowledge and municipal wastewater legal expertise to help staff address regulatory issues relating to um, pretty much the entirety of wastewater operations. So it includes discharges under NPDES permits, uh, land application of biosolids, incineration of sludges, uh, potentially air permit issues, as well as the council's industrial waste and pollution prevention program. Next slide, please. The selected special counsel here um, needs to be a law firm that has extensive experience in PFAS, municipal wastewater permitting, and relevant state and federal environmental regulatory laws, regulations, and processes. Um, this is an area of law that's it's complex, evolving, and multifaceted. Um, so for this, we set up a contract term of five years to cover all the potential issues that could come up. Um, we also set a contract amount of $5 million, both to deal with all the potential issues and, and the potential for needing um, PFAS technical expertise as part of this contract. Next slide, please. Right, now I'll go through a little bit of background on this proposal. Uh, procurement solicited proposals uh, on May 12th, 2021. The Office of Equal Opportunity um, did not assign an AMCUB goal for this highly specialized project. So we engaged in, in some detailed discussions with the Office of Equal Opportunity on, on, on this to um, make sure that we all were on the same page and understanding the scope of work. Um, eight proposals were received on June 14th, 2021. The evaluation panel held consensus meetings on July 14th and July 15th. Uh, then the evaluation panel selected the three highest ranked proposers and interviewed those proposers on July 23rd and July 26th. The evaluation panel reached consensus that Barnes & Thornburg LLP was the highest ranked and technically qualified firm to perform the services for this project. Next slide, please. So the proposed action here is that the Metropolitan Council authorizes its regional administrator to negotiate and execute a contract for PFAS legal services, uh, projects 807-849 and 808-941, contract number 21P096 to Barnes and Thornburg LLP for legal services, including legal advice and consultation on PFAS related issues in an amount not to exceed $5 million. Next slide, please. And that's the uh, end of the presentation and myself and uh, Mr. Brown are available for uh, any questions, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you, questions? Council Member Zirin. Yeah, Chair Lindstrom, I'm confused. What are we getting for $5 million? Chair Lindstrom, um, and I'm happy to answer this question. <laughs> sure. um, Mr. Chair uh, and, and, and committee members, so th this is a contract, first of all, it's, it's not, we're not paying them $5 million. It's, it's an hourly professional services contract for work up to $5 million. The work will include helping the council develop a legal strategy to deal with the number of PFAS issues that are coming down the pike. Um, where the work will go will depend on where the PFAS issues go, but it, it could include, um, in addition to developing strategy, um, it could include negotiations with the Pollution Control Agency and other agencies, um, working with other entities impacted by PFAS on strategy. It could include um, administrative proceedings as well as litigation. And then also under this umbrella is if we determine that we need technical consultants, um, that would fall under this contract as well. So that th that could be any number of things. Uh, a couple examples would be um, if the council, you know, wanted to do a project and 
test its ash for PFAS, or if the council determined that it wanted to do a fish study in the Mississippi River to look at the PFAS level levels in fish, which can have an impact on the regulation. So the context structured so we can uh, put you know pretty much all of this under that umbrella. It's uh, a good answer, and I'm curious. We are not the only entity that is likely thinking about a legal strategy around PFOS in Minnesota, much less uh, nationwide. Um, I'm just curious to know: Are is there a concerted effort with? Uh, plants like ours to be thinking about this, uh, to be thinking about legal strategies or legal liabilities around this area? Or are we going it alone here? Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, um, committee members. There, NACWA, which is a trade group here, is, is very involved um, in legal strategy. There, there's sort of, there's a legal element to, to NACWA, so they're involved in that. The law firm that we've selected, um, has a PFAS group in addition to a municipal wastewater group and is working both with industry and other utilities on this, so we're not going it alone. Um, for example, this, this law firm, Michigan has been one of the first places to move down the road of PFAS regulation for municipal wastewater. And some of the lawyers um, that are proposed to work on this from this law firm have worked on this issue for Michigan. So we should be able to take advantage of what others have done. Um, though with that said, Minnesota is moving faster than some of the other ones. So there's not a huge body of other work out there, um, but there is some and we'll leverage what is there. Uh, just a sort of quick follow up. Um, and then we'll go to Council Member Sterner. Uh, beyond the regulation and the permitting, are, are we concerned about liability that we have around PFOS, particularly, I would imagine, around land application? Uh, Mr. Chair and, and committee members, I think that's one of the reasons we're, we're bringing in outside counsel, and that would fall within the scope of that to evaluate um, potential liability. Um, and another area I, I didn't mention, but you know, that we would look at would be proposed legislation because there was some, there's been some proposed federal and state legislation that could um, have impacted the council's liability. So that also is, is, is a piece of this. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Sterner. Uh, thanks, I just was wondering uh, Tell me, like, what is the hourly rate or the retainer, the monthly retainer on, on this contract? Uh, Mr. Chair and, and committee members, as far as the hour, there, there's no monthly retainer. We, we pay the firm hourly for the work that they do. Um, the hourly rates here range from 435 to $695 an hour. It, the, the, this, you know, and these were essentially the market rates. This is highly specialized work, so it does command high rates. Just to follow up, uh, who, who is the one responsible from the Metropolitan Council and who making sure those hours are legitimate and uh, making sure of being fiscally responsible with uh, those hours and with the amount that we're paying? Sure. Mr. Chair, um, committee members, the how we typically manage these contracts is the Office of General Counsel. Well, first, I, I, the Office of General Counsel, and in this case, it'll probably be me, will work very closely with outside counsel. Uh, um, I will, uh, the Office of General Counsel then reviews the bills very closely, uh, and then we will all then pass the bills on typically to MCS to, to pay. So we, we do manage these closely and have a very good idea of what these firms are doing, making sure the work is appropriate. Um, and I can tell you we're, we're not afraid when there's something on a bill that we have a question about um, to, to raise the issues and, and firms 
are generally very quick to either answer our questions or correct the bill. Okay, and maybe one other follow-up. Uh, I mean, I'm not really feeling comfortable with a $5 million, up to $5 million. Um, have we looked at maybe a lesser amount or could we do like, you know, 1 million or 2 million and then look at a dual contract or what's the advantage of doing up to 5 million versus doing a lower amount at this time? Sure. Um, Mr. Chair and, and committee members, I think the, the amount was set here to give us the flexibility that we need. The concern, the issue is that there's so much uncertainty here um, that we want that flexibility um, and, you know, we, we this when once you hire a law firm, it's really hard to do another procurement if you run out of money and switch midstream. We also don't want to have to do sole source procurements. So we really wanted the room, especially if, if we need to do some really in-depth um, technical work here, because once we get up to speed, um, switching law firms is not something that, that will be uh, simple to do. Okay, thank you. I'm complete. Councilmember Fredson. Chair, I just had a question about um, coordination and communication with the other agents, agencies, specifically the MPCA. And I'm wondering if they have legal counsel that has this expertise or if we know if they're going to be going out to, to seek folks too. And then that sort of raises up the question of coordination. But I also uh, have a hunch that, you know, this we want to bring someone on that is looking out for the Metropolitan Council's best interests and um, making sure that we're not uh, responsible for more than our first fair share. Is that a safe assumption? Um, Mr. Chair, committee members, the I don't know if the MPCA has retained outside counsel on this, um, but th this isn't the kind of thing where we could share with the MPCA because, you know, the, the pollution, we have a conflict of interest. The pollution control agency is the regulator and the council is regulated. Um, and we want this, you know, we, we always try and work cooperatively with the agency and reach um, appropriate resolutions. But we, we need to hire a, a firm that, if necessary, could appear in administrative proceeding or in litigation involving the PCA. I will say one of the re reasons I think that this firm rose to the top, though, was their experience in negotiating, you know, sort of creative resolutions in new areas and sort of figuring out these, you know, win-win re resolutions where, um, you can figure out something that makes sense to everyone. Where is this firm headquartered? Uh, the Mr. Chair, uh, committee members, the firm is headquartered in Chicago. Um, they do have a Minneapolis office, but their Minneapolis office does not have this expertise. The lead attorneys here would be from Chicago and then some from Michigan as well, who've worked on the issue for Michigan. Councilmember Fredson. I'm, sure I don't, I, um, I'm working on my phone here, so I don't see if anyone else has is, is got their hand up for discussion, but I'd be happy to make, uh, move the staff recommendation. Thank you. Uh, one last call for, for questions or comments. Councilmember Vento. Mr. Chair, um, as, as someone who's dealt with um, environmental hazards on a personal level, I, I support this this proposal, and um, I'm grateful that that the council staff have really sought out the kind of expertise we need to really protect the interests of the council, but also the interests of the region. This PFAS issue is really a serious issue, and the folks in the East Metro area, including folks that that Council Member um, Gonzalez and I represent, um, really struggle with it, and I I really am concerned that. Um, when this becomes a, an increasingly um, newsworthy issue, folks are going to really begin to get hesitant yet again. And finding a way to get reassured when it comes to environmental hazard is really, really tough. Because every time you turn on that utility, that water, um, regardless of whether you're flushing it or you're putting it in your sink, it, it just makes you nervous. So thank you for this work. I really appreciate it. And I'll second the motion. 
Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Fredson? Aye. Sterner? No. Thank you. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zirin? No. Lindstrom? Aye. Thank you. What was the final tally on that? Th three to two? Um, four to two. Four to two. If four to we two. include your vote. Okay, thank you. Yes. And and thanks to all of you for a good conversation. Uh, moving on to the next item. We're on to our information agenda. Mossack. TAC update. Ali El Hassan. And Lanya Ross, Chair. welcome. Good afternoon, uh, committee members and Mr. Chair. I would just, I'm gonna introduce uh, Ms. Ross here, who's gonna do the presentation. Uh, Lanya Ross is an environmental analyst with the Water Supply Planning Unit. Lania is the most senior staff in the unit. She joined uh, the council in 2006. And Lania has a master's degree in geology and she is a registered geologist in Minnesota. She has been actually the chair of Minnesota, uh, uh, Minnesota Association of, of uh, Groundwater uh, for a couple of years. Uh, she came to the Met Council from Shakopee Midwakton Sioux community, working there as a hydrologist. She is the lead staff working with MOSAC and, and she is going today uh, to present about the activities that the Metro Area Water Supply Advisory Committee, which is MOSAC and their technical advisory committee has been doing over the last years and they are planning to do in the next couple of, 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 uh, of months. With that, uh, it's uh, up to Lania now to start. Welcome. Lanya, as a reminder, you'll have to unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you can. All right. Can you hear now? I can barely hear you. You're very, very quiet. All right. Bear with me here. I'm having some technical difficulties coming from a new location. Can you hear me now? You have a boom microphone, make sure you bring it down towards your mouth as well. <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you. It's just a bit faint. Not great. Not great. Very, huh? very quiet. All right. I'm going to change locations really quickly. Thing. How is the sound? That is awesome. Thank you so much. Nothing. All right, finally, I'm going to test it a third time. Is that any better? You're yes, coming in loud and clear. Perfect. perfect. Great. Fantastic. Thank you all for your patience. I feel like, of course, when I have to present to the Environment Committee, is when I'm gonna run into the most technical difficulties. So I appreciate your flexibility and your generous uh, patience with your time here. Um, I am here to give you, as Ali said, an update on some of the committee work in the uh, Water Supply Advisory Committee and their Technical Advisory Committee. And so I want to acknowledge that these committees have been doing an incredible amount of work over the past year, even with the remote meetings through this pandemic. And so I just wanna call out um, that dedication to this topic and to the leadership of um, our chair, Wendy Wolf, and to the TAC chair, Mark Maloney, for really keeping us going. Um, so as I go through this presentation, Wendy, if you want to um, add anything or clarify, please feel free to step in. Next slide.
uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate because we do a lot of work and I know that this is not top of mind for all of you, but the Metropolitan Area Water Supply Advisory Committee, MOSAC, and the Technical Advisory Committee, TAC, um, are uh, authorized in statute and they have some very specific membership and they are charged with advising and guiding the council on our water supply planning activities. And so um, this is a role and a responsibility that's been taken very seriously since it was started in 2005, 2006. So we've made a lot of progress since then. Specifically in 2021, I wanted to give you all a heads up that MOSAC and TAC have been meeting regularly. And specifically, the work plan is focused on developing some recommendations and information for a report by MOSAC to the council, including you, Environment Committee, and to the legislature. And that will include some recommendations to consider related to water supply and some connected topics. Um, and so there's uh, been some uh, drafting of some problem statements, goals, and actions over the past year. Uh, the timing on this is particularly valuable because this will be information for the council to consider as we begin work to develop, update our regional development guide and the related policy plans and system plans. So it's going to be really helpful to have this um, package of information and recommendations for us to build from. Next slide. So uh, specifically, what the committees have been working on since their kickoff on the work plan in March has been to explore some topics that have, through past conversations, past meetings, risen to the top as some priorities. So we have been talking about uh, contamination and water quality, things like PFAS and other things, um, the intersection of land use and water supply. That is something that's also a high priority with the Land Use Advisory Committee, LUAC, and so in the past there have been some joint MOSAC, LUAC workshops. Uh, groundwater and surface water interaction is also a very challenging topic that the committees are looking at right now. And this fall we'll be going into conversations focusing more on infrastructure, um, particularly water supply infrastructure. And all of this is helping to create content and direction for MOSAC's report to the Council, which we are planning to bring to you in uh, January and February. So late winter, very early spring of next year. Next slide. So um, just to give you a general sense of what the conversations have been, I wanted to share a little bit of information. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail. Uh, it's draft and it will continue to be revised, but uh, because this information is going to be coming to you later this year, um, it might be helpful to start seeding your thinking. Um, so the committees have been working on kind of clarifying the facets of the problem or the need related to this topic, starting to articulate a goal high level, and then identifying a whole range of actions that generally uh, fall in the categories of financial support, um, outreach and engagement, research, uh, maybe, maybe there's some regulatory approaches that might need looking at, and uh, regional policy and planning activities. And so, uh, for example, when we have been talking about water quality and contamination, one of the challenges that was identified pretty clearly was recognizing how there is always this potential for another contaminant emerging in our water supply systems. And we know that we are not always um, able to be nimble and proactive or best prepared to prevent spread or to be responsive as quickly as we'd like. And so as we're thinking of this topic, uh, we're thinking about a goal of all our regions changing communities and agencies being better prepared for when new emerging contaminants emerge, come. And, and how are we empowering our communities and our agencies to continue providing that safe water supply? This is kind of the level we've been talking about these. And there are some specific 
um, examples of things we could do that are identified ranging from enhancing our monitoring and our data analysis to consumer confidence campaigns so that people are aware of and know that their public utilities are being responsive and keeping their water safe um, to approaching water management in a more integrated way in our policies and planning. So uh, next slide. We've also had committee conversations around land use and water supply. And uh, one of the points that's come out of those conversations is that recognition that many of the water quality problems that we're facing today happened because we didn't realize or manage past land use practices. We didn't realize the implications of that many years ago. So we have this opportunity right now where um, being thoughtful about our land use planning and our development plans today will prevent, hopefully, legacy contamination in the future so we can leave that legacy of better water for our future. And again, a goal of um, bringing different partners together, public water suppliers, land use planners, developers, and making sure that they have the tools and are empowered to support both their communities, economic needs, social needs, while also protecting the quantity and the quality of that critical source water. Hey, Lanya. Yeah. A quick question on this topic. Uh, you, you're talking about problems happening today are, are a result of land use decisions from years past. I'm wondering if you could expand upon that. Like, I'm curious to know what problems specifically do you think are happening today that uh, meet that criteria? Yeah, I think there's a range of examples in our region, um, somewhat unfortunately, but uh, we have, uh, we're still dealing with certain Superfund sites that are, that were caused by land use practices a long time ago. St. Louis Park is um, Riley Tar, uh, TCAP contamination, um, the, the Army, Twin Cities Army Ammunition Plant operations um, were a source of contamination that, you know, we're still, even though that, that land use has changed and that source is not there anymore, um, that that contamination is still something that's moving through the system because it takes some time. Um, so those are two examples of more you know, point source problems that we've had and that are very well documented. Um, but we also see the effects of um, applications of different um, farm agricultural chemicals, some of which we no longer use. We've shifted our practices, but we're still seeing some of that contamination um, through the system. Uh, so there's there's a whole variety of point and non-point sources of um, contamination that affect different parts of our region and and we had you know and we we used, did those land use practices for some very strong reasons to support our communities um, but as we understand better where that water flows to and the different downstream users that it impacts, I think we can um, make, we, we do already and we can continue to make management decisions a little differently in a way that is more protective of our water supplies long term, my hope. Does that help? 100%, thank you. Or spark more questions? <laughs> <laughs> Probably both. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's the kind of conversation that, oh, we want to spark here in the committees and that we want to um, get people to think about in this report and to become part of ongoing policy and plan discussions as we move into this 2050 plan update process. Is there anyone else? I'm on a tablet, so I don't have as good a vision of everybody. Like, All right, next slide. Uh, the topic that we are in the midst of talking about, our uh, TAC has had this meeting and MOSAC will be meeting about this next week, is uh, groundwater and surface water interactions. And 
where the focus seems to be going with this topic is in the in the recognition that we continue to need a better understanding of our integrated water budget, the quantity, the quality, the flows between the different parts of the water cycle, between our surface waters and the underlying groundwater and vice versa, I mean, how the different use conditions affect that. So when we pump in one area, is it or is it not affecting uh, nearby surface waters? Is water quality in a surface water moving down into our groundwater system? So uh, we are gaining a better understanding about that, but uh, we do have some gaps to fill and some um, some conceptual models to, to update to understand that better. Um, we also have talked about this understanding that sub-regional approaches to management may better reflect um, how water management does extend beyond um, jurisdictional boundaries, particularly municipal jurisdictional boundaries. We manage water supply at that community level, uh, surface water is managed more at the watershed level, and so that's an that's an additional sort of challenge to this groundwater surface water integrated management. So this continues to be a very complex discussion. We'll talk more about it in the committees next week. Uh, the topic here seems to be focused around the need for more, more research and, and maybe some more modeling in addition to kind of streamlining and coordinating regulatory direction for both surface water and groundwater. So this is interesting territory to get into. Uh, next slide. Finally, we have not yet with the committees, we've, ha we've had conversations in past meetings and we've done some interviews with committee members, but we haven't um, come together as a committee to, to dig into this more deeply. But what we have talked about so far is the importance of recognizing how critical it is to maintain the ongoing sustainability of the region's water supply infrastructure. And again, water supply infrastructure is the, is the role and responsibility of local communities. Um, and it varies quite a bit across the region, but it's all critical to how our region thrives. And maintaining that infrastructure, um, you know, these are systems that are designed for, you know, decades. <laughs> so this is very long-term infrastructure. And it, we do need secure funding sources um, that both allow utilities to maintain a functioning system, but also to act nimbly and equitably when the conditions change. If a new contaminant emerges like PFAS or if there is a historic drought. So that, that utility maintenance uh, is, a, is a challenge that requires that secure funding. That in turn relies on consumer confidence, people feeling like, yes, we are willing to invest in this infrastructure because it keeps us safe. We know the value we're getting out of it. Um, and so that's in some of the pieces of where this discussion may go and based on what we've talked about so far. So I just wanted to give you a teaser about that. Uh, next slide. So um, the process, so this, these conversations will be used to generate a, a report, as I mentioned, which will be coming to you. Uh, the process that we're using to develop that report uh, has been really grounded early on in community, committee interviews, uh, staff input, um, and then that was brought to TAC for some review and revision. It's going to MOSAC for their input. And then we are just now going to be starting the process to draft the report itself. And so we're going to be asking for committee volunteers to work with staff on that draft um, and bringing it back. So the committees will have input into it, also reaching out to make sure that the member agencies have a chance to look at it and think about it, weigh in our water supply work groups and council staff, uh, because we really want this grounded in the council's work as well and, and what directions are, are feasible and uh, we may want to go again thinking about the update of these regional plan, plans and system plans. Um, it will be approved by MOSAC. It will be a MOSAC document um, and then again February, January of next year 
sharing it with the council and the legislature. So then we'll be moving into a, an outreach and engagement phase of our work. That was the highlights of what I wanted to share with the Environment Committee. Um, I would invite Wendy or Ali to add anything. Please correct me if I get anything <laughs> off um, and open it up for questions. Councilmember Wolf, any anything you'd like to add at this point? Uh, no, thanks, Mr. Chair. That was pretty thorough and accurate, so I don't think I need to add anything. Fantastic. Thank you for your leadership on this. And Ali, anything you'd like to add? Um, I just wanted to add one point uh, that MOSAC is a very unique advisory committee to the council. MOSAC is responsible for the approval of the Metro uh, Master Water Supply Plan. Uh, in addition of being a, an advisory committee, they are the entity that approves the Master Water Supply Plan that us in the water supply unit with support from other staff in, in environmental services develop uh, for as a regional guidance. So uh, it's, it's a very unique entity. It's a very unique advisory committee that has, uh, has also the advisory role, but at the same time, they have um, an approval role for the master water supply plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from committee members? Also, any concerns or suggestions for things to consider adding in this report? It will be a report for you. You are our target audience. So if there's any <laughs> background information that you would like, we will work to add that. Well, it sounds like you'll be keeping us in the loop along the way, and we'll certainly have a chance to weigh in on the final report. Um, so, so I may not be able to see everybody on my screen here, but I think we, uh, I'll just do one final call if there's any other questions or comments. Thank you for the opportunity to give this update. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. And that takes us to our second information item, which is an update on land application communication materials for Dakota County. Ms. Hutter or Colton Janes? Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. As a quick introduction, my name is Colton Janes. I'm the new East Area Business Unit Manager. I've been with the council for all of three weeks. I'm a Class A wastewater operator, a professional engineer, and a recent MBA graduate. On to the presentation. So as a quick, uh, enhanced communication to the Empire Land Application Program are needed to foster transparency, alleviate community concerns, and develop program partnerships that support continued land application at the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant. This afternoon, Heidi and I will, would like to share an update regarding the recent uh, launch of the new communication resources. Next slide. We will share some background on the land application program, discuss recent outreach efforts that inform development of our key messages, and review recent investments made by the program that demonstrate MCES commitment to land application at the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plan. Here are the topics we'll cover, land application program overview, program partner outreach and feedback, our key messages, program investment, and communication materials. Next slide. Land application is not new at MCES. We have been successfully returning nutrients to local farm fields to improve crop yields and soil health since 1982. Land application practices are developed and overseen by the EPA and MPCA and are inherently protective of public health and the environment. MCES meets all state and federal requirements for land application of biosolids, including site approval, testing, application practices, and annual reporting. Next slide. 
The Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant primarily serves Dakota County communities with the exception of Elko and New Market located in neighboring Scott County. Biosolids produced in the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant are beneficially reused within Dakota County by farmers growing corn or, or soybeans for the use of animal feed. Specific to the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant, land application is completed in the spring and fall, although fall provides the best opportunity for application. We produce 15,000 tons of biosolids per year and distribute over approximately 500 acres. Currently have 1,600 acres within the program with more being added annually. Next slide. MCES identified a need to enhance program communications following recent community concern about PFAS and long-term impacts on land application human health and the environment, specifically protection of drinking water. MCS interviewed community leaders and farmers who participated in the land application program to solicit feedback and about the program from their perspective and learn what additional information would be valuable to them and to local residents. This feedback will enhance the program and communication and will also improve land application program procedures moving forward. Next, Heidi will discuss partner feedback. Thanks, Colton. Next slide, please. We interviewed community leaders in the townships of Castle Rock, Douglas, Empire, Marchand, and Randolph. Townships interact with the program through farmer applications. They help determine the proper delivery routes to bring products to the fields. They provide dust control, and they also do coordination and perform road repair. Um, and they also field occasional questions or um, complaints from residents. And most often those tend to be related to odor or traffic. Most of our townships understood the need to recycle biosolids and they agreed that it's better to land apply them than to landfill them. They did also note that it would be helpful to them to know what is actually in biosolids. And they wanted to be assured that land application practices are protective of human health and the environment. They also want to understand what the long-term impacts of land application on their communities are with respects to contaminants of emerging concern. And as Colton mentioned, specifically PFAS. MCES was asked about PFAS and biosolids at a public hearing earlier in the year. Our response then remains true today, and that is that the national regulatory framework for controlling PFAS in the environment is still under development. The PCA is establishing local water quality, quality criteria for water bodies, which can then be translated into effluent limits. The EPA has not yet developed standards for biosolids. What has been new or become new in the last couple of weeks is that the EPA has published its very first draft of a new testing method for PFAS in eight different media, which would include wastewater, biosolids, and landfill leachate. And they, they plan to complete a multi-laboratory validation study of that method in 2022. They have noted that while that method is not nationally required for compliance monitoring until the EPA has promulgated it through rulemaking, the EPA is recommending it now for use in individual permits. We'll remain in contact with the PCA to discuss what their approach will be in Minnesota, and we'll be able to take action on testing our biosolids as soon as reasonably possible once clear direction on this issue is available to us. Next slide, please. MCES also interviewed farmers participating in the program in order to understand what the value of the program is to them and what we could do from their perspective to make improvements. In general, farmers are very familiar with our program and with its benefits. They noted specifically the fertilizer value in biosolids, and they're very supportive of recycling biosolids in the community. They were also highly complimentary of staff executing the program as they tend to work with them very closely. They noted increased community concern and interest as the residential development continues in Dakota County and it starts to approach their fields. There was a desire from them to have access to more information about biosolids uh, and the MCS program in order to communicate the needs and benefits of the practice to their neighbors and community leaders. The largest concern from farmers was related to compaction and product application. Precision farming practices are increasingly more popular and there is a desire from farmers for us to become more involved in the process. Incorporating biosolids into the soil and the services of a crop consultant to provide soil sampling services 
and a field management plan were mentioned as items farmers would like to explore. These types of services do fall outside of the required responsibility of a biosolids land application program. Additional program services like these would have to be balanced against our ratepayer expectations. We are still evaluating and implementing changes to the program, but community and partner feedback is a really important part of that process. Next slide. Taking time to understand community concerns and identifying information gaps allowed us to develop a standard, me standard messaging to share information about the benefits and value of land application in Dakota County, and it helps us address some of the known concerns. We've developed five key messages that make up the communications framework for the program. I'd like to share those with you and offer a little bit of additional context for each one as we go. Number one, biosolids are a valuable renewable resource produced at wastewater treatment plants that should be recycled. Biosolids are comprised of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and other key nutrients like potassium, copper, zinc, and nickel that plants need for growth. The organic nitrogen in biosolids is a slow release form that's taken up by the plant's root systems as needed throughout the growing season. And the carbon in the biosolids helps hold those nutrients near the soil surface. It makes the soil healthier, it makes it more drought tolerant, and it reduces runoff and erosion, which is it's important. Number two, land application at the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant benefits Dakota County and Empire Township. Biosolids are a cost-effective alternative to commercial fertilizers, and they help farmers operate more sustainably by reducing the use of commercial fertilizers and pesticides. Number three, biosolids production and land application are highly regulated to be protective of public health and the environment. Quality standards and best management practices developed and overseen by the EPA and MPCA are protective of public health and the environment. The PCA approves all sites and they train and certify operators who oversee the use of biosolids. The site approval process includes providing a plan for each site, defining where, how much, and when biosolids will be applied, what the soil conditions of the field are, and how surface and groundwaters will be protected throughout that entire process. Biosolids are tested before each application season and a certified operator determines how much to apply and that application rate is based on current and past farming practices, the specific crops grown, and soil health. And then every year we submit a report to the PCA in order to confirm that best management practices have been followed. Number four, MCES is committed to improving and investing in the land application program. We're using feedback from our customer communities and program partners to improve the customer experience. We have made investments in the facility that increase solids processing capacity and support continued land application in Dakota County. Number five, collaborating with communities, watersheds, and industries to reduce pollutants at the source is often the most cost-effective and efficient way to address regional water quality challenges. MCES has a history of partnering locally to successfully achieve source reduction for water quality challenges like mercury and phosphorus, and we will do the same to address new regional water quality challenges like PFAS. Next slide. Right now, we are in the middle of an almost $50 million program that will increase the solids processing capacity of the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant. Improvements support continued growth in the service area and they advance council sustainability initiatives by recovering, treating, and utilizing biogas as a renewable fuel source for on-site heat and power production and use. Specific to the land application program, improvements provide additional biosolid storage capacity and new land application equipment. Next slide. Accessible public facing information about the program fosters transparency and it reduces the spread of misinformation regarding the program and our practices. We recently launched a new website where the public can go to learn more about our land application program and they can also connect with us directly. Additionally, we've developed several program resources available on the website in the form of some quick, easy to digest handouts. The Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant Overview handout includes an overview of the plant and it highlights our sustainability story and recent capital improvements. The Land Application Program handout summarizes the benefits and the process of land application, including a summary of quality standards and best management practices that protect public health and the environment. 
long-term stewards together highlights MCES's past success with source reduction, which is the most efficient and effective way to address regional, regional water quality issues like PFAS. The PFAS fact sheet shares information about PFAS in general. It shares what we're doing about, to address the issue, what people can do as consumers to help protect the environment, and it gives the web location of our existing PFAS data so anyone can check us out. Each handout also identifies a direct point of contact within MCES that the reader can connect with for further information. Bolton did mention earlier that we've been land applying since 1982. That is since the beginning of the practice in the state of Minnesota. So for almost 40 years, we have quietly executed a program providing localized community benefit with an exceptional level of service. Continued growth in the service area advances in precision farming practices and evolving water quality standards will require us to invest in and adapt the program to ensure its continued success in Dakota County. Enhanced communications is a pretty good start to that. Next slide, please. We shared a lot of information with you tonight. We just kind of want to pause, uh, step back here and take a moment to answer your questions. Thank you. Great presentation, both of you. Uh, any questions from committee members? I'll start out with one. Uh, Heidi, I think you mentioned that we're currently, uh, we currently have about, I think it was like 1,500 or so acres in the program and you anticipated that growing. Just curious to know how how big do you think this can possibly get? Where how much growth do you think it'll it'll uh, how much growth will we see in the say the next year, next five years? Would be your guess. That's a great question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Environment Committee, right now our facility uses about 500 acres a year to handle um, its its current size at 10 mgd the flows we see. The facility itself is, is physically able to handle just over double that. So uh, without further expansion, so if you were asking me for the next five or 10 years, I might say it's still about 500 acres. If we consider the amount of acreage we need to support the facility's current build size, I would tell you about 1,000 acres. And then if we consider that the ultimate um, facility size for the region in that area is 50 MGD, I might say it's about 2,000 acres, just rules of thumb. Of course, that doesn't really consider uh, changes in regulatory requirements that we might have come towards us or any changes in precision farming practices, which could impact uh, land needs as we move forward. Thank you. I think a good rule of thumb is that it's impossible to over communicate when it comes to this topic, right? I mean, people are very interested in learning about it, learning about what is being applied and uh, and it's great to hear that the farmers that are participating in the process want additional communication. First of all, it's great to hear that they're complimentary of of staff and of the program, but they want more communication so that they can share with their neighbors, with their communities, what this is all about. Uh, Councilmember Vento. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm curious as to what other waste treatment systems around the country are doing something similar to this. Mr. Chair and members of the Environment Committee, land application is a very common practice. So if we uh, consider nationwide, it's more than half of the wastewater utilities in the entire nation land apply. If we look at Minnesota, it's almost the majority. It's um, over 90%. It's, it's very common in Minnesota. Other questions? Colton, congratulations on getting that MBA and starting work at the Met Council and you're off to a good start. Thanks, <laughs> excited to be here. And great presentation, both of you. All right, thank you again. Thank you. Let's see here, that takes us to the general manager's report. Lisa, good, good afternoon. 
Hello. Well, um, in the near future, we're going to be bringing you an information item on our ES equity goal work. And since you're already seeing some surveying activities, I thought it would be a good time to um, bring this to your attention. So uh, you should have received a request to participate in a survey last week called the Diamond Inclusiveness Survey. This is part of our ES initiative work in support of the council's equity goals. And it will help ES develop specific equity goals and work plans. You also heard about an earlier survey from one of our urban scholars back on August 10th. And that survey was exclusive to ES staff. This survey, on the other hand, is a cross section of stakeholders, both internal and external. So you all received a request to participate in the survey. Um, it is geared to give us a collective assessment of our strengths, our weaknesses, and our opportunities for improvement. Uh, we will apply a continuous improvement approach, and we will leverage that survey feedback to focus us on our best short and long-term opportunities for improvement. You have until September 24th to complete that short confidential survey. I want to thank you if you've already done so, but if you haven't, please consider doing so because we would really value your input. And again, as I said, staff will be back in the near future to share more in-depth information about this important work, which um, is going on across the council. And we want to make sure that we can set a good path forward to, to really make a dent in these goals that we have as a council. And that concludes my report for today. Thank you. I just pulled up that email and I'll do it right now. Promise. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> All right. Any other closing remarks from committee members? Yeah, Chair Lindstrom, if I have a could have a few moments. I just uh, came off uh, our Clean Water Council's uh, conference on uh, Sunday and Monday. So if I could just share a little bit what we uh, uh, did and saw over the last couple of days. Please do so. Take care. Okay, thank you. Well, um, well, we basically went to the southwest uh, part of the state where we saw Nobles, Rock, and Pipestone counties and kind of got to see what their water issues are. And most of their wells are like 65 feet deep and they have actually water shortage issues. So they kind of like are in the Missouri River area where they try to get water. Um, and some of the issues were like corn and, and beans are their two uh, cash crops where their land is really expensive. You know, it goes from you know, 12,000 or $20,000 an acre um, with it. And, and the way that's kind of set up is that they can insure that one and they get the money there. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of other opportunities. So there was like some of the people from Rock County and such were working with farmers to uh, take the land out of production and using some of the alfalfa. And they're working with kerns like you know we we know of and uh, make an area for like pheasant, pheasants uh, as well. Um, and then we finished with like Pipestone got a national award from EPA uh, for their plant. They installed a new plant last year, and what it was is they they were the only city in the country to get a plant that uh, address for their uh, creative solutions, well, I guess problem solving from EPA. But they, they put in a water uh, treatment plant that used osmosis and lime cleaning. And they were actually were going through a lot of the members of the city and they were actually removing water softeners. And some some of the people that were they, you know, were apprehensive about removing them, they at least like readjusted their settings where like some were at the max settings and uh, reduced it. So at this point, uh, they have, uh, let me just look at the numbers real quick, but they were uh, looking at uh, 309 milligrams per liter of uh, chloride was in their, uh, was in the water. And now uh, th that was in 2019. And now they're like, I think close to one, 150 or so. So they've cut it in half uh, with their new uh, central softening plant. Um, and at the same time, Pipestone has a kind of a agreement with uh, where their library is in with their school and uh, city government. So they had a We Are Water exhibit there as well that we toured. And that's coming up to St. Paul 
soon. And the way that we are watered, they actually custom make it through the local area where they looked at local individuals and local stories. Uh, and, that, and that was you know very interesting where they showed that people could like uh, pretend they were a farmer and they could you know answer some questions, of course, give some testimony. Um, and there were some other things. And then we like also toured uh, some other, uh, besides the fields and that, we, we looked at Blue uh, Mounds Park and they looked, uh, we had a couple of geologists that talked to us about geology. And uh, there were people from the uh, Department of Health and Department of Ag there as well. So it was a pretty good uh, learning experience and networking with uh, the members of the Clean Water Council and the Minnesota professional staff there. So I enjoyed it. And uh, anybody have questions what we did, I'm more than happy to you know, share more more about it in that. Yeah. So thank you for thank you thank for allowing you. me to come tonight. That's a part of the state that's had uh, water challenges for a decade or so. And it's good to hear that Pipestone is approaching it in a creative manner and and, and an award-winning manner. So that's great. Thank you. Very cool. Uh, any other comments? We are. Chair, hold yes. on, chair. Oh, oh hold chair. on. <laughs> I, ju I just wanna. I just would like uh, to make sure that. The public knows that Council Member Sterner is not driving at the moment. Can you? Can that you is tell correct. Public? I'm not driving, right? I'm using the Metropolitan Council phone. I'm sitting in my car. I, I got done playing tennis with uh, some people that are uh, in the area, and for my office, I jumped in the car. But I'm definitely not driving, and I, I obey the rules really well. So thank you for allowing me that. <laughs> share that then and I would have sat in the park but uh, the other guys with a tennis group were there so I I kind of moved away from them so I'm sitting here in the Dina in the Normandale Park right now next to the tennis and pickleball court so <laughs> so yeah thank you for allowing me to share that ring thank you <laughs> duly noted and thanks for calling that out all right thanks everybody have a great afternoon we are adjourned Bye now.